Right, our next lesson uh, is all about formatting and labeling. Um, we're going to look at an actual proper kind of site map. Um, so the first thing I am going to have to do is actually create that map and then we're going to format it using um, phase one uh, symbols and produce something that looks like a an actual phase one map for a site. So yes, let's get QGIS open again. Uh, I'm going to create some new layers. First layer I'm going to create is a polygon layer for the site boundary. We're not going to give that any attributes because it's just going to be a single polygon with a red line. So that's okay. We're gonna we don't want that as part of the group. Um, let's just shut down that group. So a new layer for habitats. Again, don't just name it here. I'm going to open this up. Um, oh god, I'm not on top form with spelling today. This is going to be habitats, again it's going to be polygon. We're going to have phase one habitat code as text data. I'm going to add that to the field. We're going to just stick an area as a potential bonus as well. That's going to be a decimal number. Add. That's good enough for polygons. We also want a new layer for point habitats, like scattered trees. Point. Uh, just call it have type text data. Okay. And another one for lines as well. I realize I didn't really go into the creation of lines and points in the last video, but they're pretty much the same as pretty much the same as uh, polygons. messed up with that last layer. Um, so this is line habitats. Line do, 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 do. Habitat. Add. Okay. Where did points go? So this doesn't have a file path, it's just got a file name. So what we want to do with that is export to point habitats. And then delete the original one, which was the original one. Is that the original one? Yeah, that's the original one. We'll just remove that because that's just a temporary layer. <coughs> right, first job, site boundary. So it's going to be red line site boundary. So we want to have it transparent with a red line. Five pixels be enough? We shall find out. So, obviously, we're just making this site boundary up because this isn't a genuine site. We'll 
just use the extent of the park. Again, using the whole holding down space to scroll. Working our way around the whole of the site boundary. Again, because this is a demonstration, I may be going a little bit quicker than and a little less accurate than what I maybe would usually do. So let's just imagine we messed up and put an extra point here. And then we came in too close here. I'm doing this as very exaggerated. Um, sometimes you do this in the middle of a shape and you go, oh God, and then you want to start from scratch again. Uh, don't, just continue on, right click at the end. Then you can bring in the vert, vertex editor tool. Uh, do you know what? We don't really need that point, but we're going to bring it back onto the line here. And we're going to bring this one back up here as well. And then that's our site boundary and we can finish editing that. So what I usually do at this point is then take our habitats layer, start editing and basically trace around our site boundary. Don't think it's set to all layers. So we just need a few clicks, one there, one there. You can see the area that it's uh, creating. Um, so we know there's another vertex up here. So we'll snap onto that. And then that is the same area covered with our um, habitats layer. <laughs> And then we can just start using the tools that I've previously shown, the fill tool and the split features tool to start cutting our areas. I'm not going, because this is just a demonstration and it's not a real site map, I'm going to be a little bit creative with some of these habitats and I'm going to ignore things like footpaths because it would take a long time, a lot longer than what I want to spend on this demonstration um, to actually draw those. So, Ooh, sorry, what tool we're we using here? I've stopped thinking for a second. Right, so start outside, come inside, a little bit up there, trace the outline here to this edge and then here right click and then that's separated that from the other area so we've got two there now um, we've got this area up here that's also suitable to be sn sl kind of sliced out in that way again I am just going to ignore the footpath see I've accidentally clicked over there but because this is the it's not a standard shape tool. I want to cancel that. It may get to a point where I just then start fast forwarding this part of the... Um, oh, I've done it again. Oh, it's this new mouse. <laughs> Let's blame the tools. It's because I'm trying to press the middle button and I keep pressing the left button instead. So let's forget that and just use the space bar like I usually do. So again, we're cutting out these areas. I'm going to basically finish with maybe four different habitat types here. I'm going to use woodland. It's going to be some areas of hard standing. Where did I start on this one? I started outside, good. So 
So all these that are on the edge, they're suitable for this tool because they're not contained within a shape. They're on the edge of a shape, they have common boundaries. Again, just going through this quite quickly, it's not a an exercise of precision. Um, that's everything we have on the edge. So these areas now are going to be suitable for the fill ring, because it's fully contained within another feature. nearly snapped onto that other one. That would have made it not work ultimately because then it would be sharing a boundary. In fact, while I'm drawing these, and I know I'm not going to be snapping onto anything, it's a good idea to turn snapping off. Um, I'll get onto these habitat complexes in a minute where you've got multiple habitats within another habitat. I'm going to draw all the individual ones first because there's a couple of different ways you can approach them. So I'll just stay with the fill ring and the habitats that are solely within another habitat. Imagine for some people this is as exciting as watching paint dry. Again, just left clicking to place your points, right clicking to finish your shape. Uh, let's include this building. I want to do something special with buildings. Obviously we're just working from the base map because I don't actually have any phase one site notes for this site. Uh, one thing you could do um, would actually be to digitize your site notes, sorry, scan them into a image file and then actually georeference your site notes onto here. So then you could literally just trace around the areas that you've drawn in the field and actually uh, compare those with uh, say like an aerial image of the site as well to see if you've got the habitat boundaries correct. I'm gonna make this hard standing area here as well. Actually no we're not, we're just gonna do this bit because this is the tennis courts. Local knowledge that. <laughs> Right, I think these are the only habitats that we've got left. Um, so you can see that these here are touching, so it's not a single habitat contained within another habitat type. It's kind of two habitats within. So there's two options to deal with this. You can either trace around all of the habitat complex and then cut it out. So like split between the pond 
um, and the woodland. Actually, let's just do that. So again, I'm just doing this very quickly. The only thing that I want to avoid here is to touch any other edges. Uh, so I wouldn't want to accidentally snap onto somewhere like that. So we basically draw around the habitat complex and then we can use the split features tool to... I do want to snap there though. Snap onto that. It's not going to be the right shape but again this is just a demonstration. So that should now split these two. So we have a separate pond from the woodland. Or the other option would be to use fill ring on one of these parts so to cut out the pond on its own not worrying about the islands within the ponds and then we are considering this as the shape that we want to split a part out of so we want to split this bit of woodland out of this larger yellow shape um, so if we start inside of the pond <coughs> come out here again just doing this very roughly very quickly because digitizing is not ah uh, yeah i'll just i'm because i've snapped onto here i'm just going to finish at this point should have come along here this leather but i've made a mistake there so let's just right click and now that's separated the pond from there so two options either you add everything as a habitat complex and then split the individuals or you can create the ring and then start splitting from the edge of that ring and i believe that is all of our habitats now um, digitized so we're going to save this so as i was saying before you can select uh, multiple so if you hold down control you can so we're going to call all of these areas woodland areas so we're going to select them all I know these are not all woodland areas, but for the purpose of this exercise, to keep it a limited number of habitat types, we are going to call them all woodland areas. <laughs> Missed one out there, but that's not really important because that's not the purpose of this exercise. So I mentioned earlier about adding attributes as a bulk process rather than typing the same each individual time. So we go up here to the digitizing toolbar and we select to modify the attributes of all the selected features simultaneously. Select. So area. It's not area. It's phase one code. I'm just going to use phase one text to be perfectly honest. I'm not even going to use accurate ones. I'm just going to call it woodland. Woodland, okay. So if we now go into the attributes table for this, open attribute table, we can see that all of those features are now called woodland and the rest of them, so you can order this by whatever you call them. We have then all of these which have no habitat code. We do want to give them a code so we've got that there and that there are buildings so again do the same thing phase one habitat called building okay <clears throat> uh, what have we got left So that is hard standing, that's also hard standing. Oh, that's a pond, so we've got a pond there. So let's just 
do these in here. So that's just call it HS for hard standing. Um, that is all grassland. That is a building. We know that. Um, hard standing. So this, this is moving down because I've got this organized by phase one habitat code. So as soon as this is given a value, it moves down to the other hard standing parts. This last part there is also a pond. And that I believe is all of our habitats have now got a habitat type. Uh, what I'm going to do at this stage is also add some additional attributes to these. So things like ponds and buildings, you may want to number for different reasons and you may also want to give them other attributes. So like, um, let's create a building number. Oh, I'm actually called build no, it might not fit. Build no whole number yes so we've got this new attribute here now so we can call this building one call this building two um, we're also going to save you may also if you've got things like ponds call that pond number and click on ok so we've got the ponds here so pond number one Pond number two, you may want to give your woodland areas different numbers, but I'm not going to do that. Um, probably wouldn't want to do that hard standing. This is going to come into play with uh, later on where, when we actually do the formatting and adding label, labels and um, actually because this is a building, let's call this B1. Um, Call that B2 and call this P1 and P2. Ah, because I did it is uh, I I wrote, I did it as a numerical field only. It'll only allow me to put numbers in here. So what I'm going to do is delete building number and pond number create these again but have them as text build no text length uh, that's going to be three at the most and then also pond no Right, so for building B1. So can you can fill these in as the attribute uh, thingy pops up, but if you, especially if you're doing things on bulk, um, sometimes doing it afterwards, selecting them all might be the better way. Sometimes it's easier just to blast through the actual georeferencing part sorry not the georeferencing the digitizing part and then uh, deal with the attributes afterwards it all depends on how complex your map is okay the reason things may have just started to look suddenly very different is because uh, originally at this point i made some mistakes and i've had to backtrack a little bit uh, partly because I didn't have some files prepared that I was going to need and partly because I'm just generally a bit of an idiot. So let's pick up from where we left off, which I believe we were in the attribute table, which you will now see is lacking some values and has some additional habitat codes on the ends of uh, the habitat descriptions. <clears throat> so where were we? We had just inputted building numbers and pond numbers. Um, so other things that you may collect during your 
an initial phase one habitat survey that you may want to display. Uh, actually, not really on phase one habitat survey. You might have done a building inspection for bats at the same time as well. So let's create another field for bat potential. These are all going to be related to some fancy formatting uh, that's coming soon. So bear with me. Uh, bat potential text string. Yep, we'll have some of that. And also maybe HSI uh, categories for your ponds as well. So let's create HSI category. Not number. We're going to use the <coughs> the actual wording word categories rather than the HSI value. Uh, again, this isn't training for those particular survey types. This is just something that will help do some uh, creative formatting in a bit. So let's say we've got a low potential building and a high potential building. And for our ponds, we've got a poor and a good pond. Uh, so that's all of the things that we've collected in the field, maybe. Yep. So one other thing you can do, and I did create this field earlier, but I decided to delete it. Uh, no good reason for that, actually. But um, something you can calculate using the field calculator up here is the area for all these, these different polygons, which may be useful for things like if you're doing a Briam assessment and you need to measure the areas uh, or biodiversity net gain calculation, again, needing to measure areas. So first thing we're going to do is actually go into... <coughs> the project properties and look what our units are. So we're measuring distances in meters and areas in hectares. So if that's not what you want it to be, then change it. Because if you update the option to change it from uh, meters to hectares, then it won't update the attribute table. You'll have to do the calculations again. Um, so where is my attribute table gone? So this is going to be in hectares. So let's create a new field and call it area. And it's in hectares, so we can put that there. Um, it's going to be a decimal number. <coughs> I'll just leave these as defaults. Open the field calculator. We're going to update the existing field, which is area. And then it's a geometry function. Double click on area and then press OK. And then that is now all of the areas in hectares for all of these individual shape files. You can export the attribute table into Excel. Um, so if you're wanting to do anything with those areas, I'm uh, not going to show you how to do that right now though. Uh, maybe that's another video sometime. <coughs> so, right, we're finished with all of our creating of data so we're gonna stop editing and close that now so we have all these habitats individually uh, individually created there's no overlaps there's no slithers they're all unique individual habitats um, so now we need to get some formatting on them I have to make them actually look look like a a proper map. Um, so if we open the properties on the layer that you want to format. Um, 
so I may have said this earlier if you're doing anything like styling um, that involves the properties of a layer you're not editing the data within that layer the actual shape files themselves we're editing how the project is deciding to style these layers um, so that's important to remember we're not if this isn't toggled for that layer then it's not an edit to that layer it's an edit to the project and not to the actual data within the layer so anyway we've got single symbol symbology at the moment and what we want to do uh, we can get rid of the opacity now because we are wanting to overlay this on our base map without the base map actually showing through so what we do is we we need to do a characterized symbology and we're going to characterize the symbology based on the habitat code we click on classify here and then all the different habitats are giving at the moment it's set as random color if we press apply though and then we can look that they're all different colors based on habitat type but it looks horrendous and it's not looking like a standard phase one map one would look like um, <clears throat> so we need a file that contains all of the stylings for phase one I will post this on the Facebook group page. Um, I couldn't use the one that I usually use because it was created at work. So I can't hand that out willingly. I've had to recreate one by downloading from the JNCC website. They've got a .style file, which is meant for ArcGIS and not QGIS. So it didn't work straight away i've had to run it through a few of the programs to actually convert it to the right format which is xml um, so what we need to do to get that xml file into qgis is to go to settings and style manager you'll see that there's some um, these are the favorites at the moment that are up here they're just kind of default it's nothing that i've actually defined as favorites if we look at all then you'll see we've got some phase one things in here we've got some preset ones um, there's two versions of each because some are the ones that i've created from the gncc file which are the ones that are just the numeric ones sorry just the ones with the code rather than the habitat description the ones that have the description are my are the ones that i use at work and there's some edits to these um, based on the the actual uh, GNCC published ones some of these haven't converted over properly as well um, but most of them are correct and it will get you started at least so what we need to do is go to import export and we're going to import items <clears throat> we need to find the location of our style file I've got it down here it's an xml they are qml versions but i'm not a big fan of how they work um, and you haven't got a lot of control over making edits to them it's just sort of like a preset style sheet that you apply based on values rather than um, yeah i'm just not comfortable using them i prefer xml um, so anyway we select that open It'll show you all of the available styles, select all, and then press import. Because I already have them um, imported, it's asking me if I want to overwrite. So I'm just going to cancel that. Um, so now we close the style manager. We open up our uh, properties for this again. So our first first style we're going to apply is building which is j3.6 so if we double click on here and we can search for j3.6 
you can see there's the one from the uh, the new star file and that's the one from my own um, from my work one they're identical so nothing to really worry about there so for double well don't need to double click on it just click OK that's now styled as black we've got some B6 grassland which is some semi-improved poor semi-improved grassland so B6 you can see the difference between these styles here so we'll select that one HS hard standing there isn't a GNCC code for hard standing it would just usually go down as other habitat but I think it looks it's more sensible just to put uh, a grey layer on it so I have a just a grey colour already set out pond G1 standing water again you may disagree with some of these categories that I'm giving these but this is just an exercise on styling rather than on accurate phase one mapping uh, and we've got some a 1.1.1 which is broadleaf semi-natural woodland <coughs> so we'll apply that there we'll remove that because we know there's no other there's nothing that doesn't actually have a format and then we'll click apply okay and now this is our phase one map as you can see unfortunately this style file doesn't have um, a white background on some of these symbols so what we can do is make a very quick edit to that so we can basically white out the background so the base map doesn't show through so if we double click on here so you can either double click directly on a symbol to edit it or go back through into properties and then symbology but it's just quick if you just double click it here um, so basically these are all the items that make up um, this uh, this style uh, we need to add a new one uh, we also need to move it to the very bottom come on go down oh no sorry it's using the arrows uh, so as you can see that's now that marker over um, <coughs> The original marker over a blue background we don't want that we want a white background um, and then we'll take the line off the edge as well but it's still got the original edge line if it had one and then if we press ok that's now whited out um, the semi-improved areas so that the base map's no longer showing through um i haven't really given any attention to point and line um features at this point so i'm just going to very quickly um draw a line i know on this site we've got a hedgerow running down this side here so let's just stick that in it's exactly the same way as drawing a polygon um, let's just take these off i'm gonna use snapping on all layers because we're gonna snap to the the actual site boundary because i know it runs down that side of the site and we'll just do vertex as well um, so yeah start drawing by left clicking that's just one straight line all the way down I've accidentally clicked there so I'm gonna unclick that again blame this mouse it's basically all the way down that line and right click to stop habitat type let's call it hetero <coughs> So that at the moment is styled as a single blue line. Uh, we have got our phase one. Um, when I brought these styles in into the pro in into QGIS, I give them the tag of GNCC converted. So if you want to see all the 
all of the um, all of the symbology that's been brought in through that particular layer, you can use it. You can use these uh, tags to um, help kind of bring them up. Um, if you take that off, it will literally just show them all. Um, if you go hedge, it'll then show you everything that has the word hedge. So I'm wanting a species rich hedgerows with trees. I didn't really say trees. I know it does have trees in. So we'll go for this one here, J2.3.1. I'll just go J2.3.1. And this is what the converted symbology from JNCC looks like as opposed to uh, my own custom one. So I might actually prefer some of these better. I'll have to have a look at them. I've always just used the same style file that I was given to you when I first started. So let's apply that and go OK. And then you'll see we've now got a hedgerow down the side of the site. Similar with point habitats. Let's just save and finish editing that point habitats. Um, the main thing that I use point habitats for are um, things like uh, scattered trees. So if we actually find where I've put the um, the aerial photo layer, we'll just open that up and look at the areas where we may have scattered trees outside of woodland groups. Again, if you remember, this wasn't a exercise in accurate mapping. So uh, I'll just add some trees here. We are going to have bits where we've got trees that probably should be considered the same woodland group. But this is just an example on how to map things, not on how to do phase one surveys. Anyway, you get the idea. Left click to place a point. There's nothing you have to do after that. It's only a single click because there's no uh, distance or shape associated with points. Um, to do the symbology of points, it's exactly the same. Because we're only using a single point in this layer, um, we can use the single symbol. Um, get rid of that. So I'm going to use broadly a 3.1. So as you can see, that's a symbol that hasn't converted over properly. Um, and you could very easily just modify this to a kind of simple marker. At the moment, its font will change that to a, oh, what's my other one? What does my other one use? Um, so I've used marker, simple marker, and then a circle and this green color. So I'm going to copy that colour and we're going to go. So we're actually going to edit this um, the three point one just to make it the same. Just to show you guys how to actually edit one of these. So again, it's a marker. I'm going to use a simple marker. Just select that from here, and then you've got a circle down the bottom. Um, and I believe that's the same colour, but we'll just paste that in anyway, and we'll apply. So, and all our trees will be shown by these green circles. <coughs> so, we'll put the rest of the habitats back on now. This is looking more and more like an actual phase one habitat survey map now. I'm going to turn the editing off of that layer. All the other ones are finished as well. So that's symbology on lines, polygons and 
um, lines, polygons, and points. So now we're going to look at how to label label features. Um, I think one of the obvious ones would be maybe to label the pond numbers. Say that we were referring to uh, ponds in one of the in our report, and we wanted these highlighted. So we open the layer. We go to labels. We select single labels. And then we look at, we need to tell it which la which attribute we're going to label it from. Um, and then we can have pond number here. And yeah, buffer, draw text buffer. Uh, there's all sorts of different options you can use in here. I'm not going to go through these all because that in itself is a big lesson. Uh, all I can say is play with them. Just open up a project, create some shape files, add some data to those shape files, and just play with how the labeling works. Um, it's how I learned most of what I know. Um, so yeah, just just have a play. But you can see now we have our pond labelled up with um, with what they actually are. Uh, so pond one and pond two. Um, <clears throat> if we were wanting sort of like all features that have a label um, labelled up on the same map, it would be a good idea to to actually have them in a in in a single column. Um, I've done this deliberately like this because usually you'd have maybe a, a phase one habitat plan and then you might be single specifically um, showing plans for things like ponds and newts and bats and buildings and trees. So a lot of the time I like to kind of have plans for individual things like that. Uh, but you can just put them all in one layer and then when you do that they'll they'll actually show up. So I'm going to show you something a little bit more advanced with symbology that I occasionally use sometimes. Um, so we're going to use the buildings as an example. Um, and we've already we already in the attribute table have uh, different data for these buildings in terms of their bat roost potential. Um, so what we're going to do is make a copy of this layer. So we're going to duplicate it. We're not copying the underlying data. We're just basically saying we're creating a copy of this, a copy of the formatting. It's a different way of formatting the same layer within the same project. Um, it's basically from the start looks identical to the original one. If we go into properties, <clears throat> Instead of the phase one code, we're going to use the bat potential. And we're going to delete all the previous ones. Again, it doesn't get rid of any data, just is overwriting the formats. Use bat potential. We've got two of them. If we apply that to that layer and then look, everything is blue because it has no bat roost potential. Then we've got the green and the other part up there. Let's make these more meaningful colors. So I often put high potential buildings as red um, and low potential. We'll just leave that as green and then remove this because we don't want to actually um, display data where there's no value. <coughs> so we've got that now over there. If we bring this up, that'll then display over the top of the original. Maybe we don't want to use a full block color. Um, but say, let's go back into here. And for high potential, we'll put it transparent. So the original black of the building shows through. And then we give it a red. Uh, dotted outline and then for this we can 
make that transparent um, stroke color again we'll give it a green um, dotted outline apply and okay so then you can see around these buildings that they've actually got outline colors based on um, based on their bat roofs potential. You could do something similar for the ponds as well to show ponds of different great crested newt HSI categories. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can play around with symbology on a map. Sometimes you just want a straight basic phase one map. Um, sometimes you want something a bit more complex. If it gets too complicated and messy though, it's a bad map. If it's not readable, then don't do it. Make a separate map and highlight it that way. But if you can incorporate multiple sets of data onto the same map and still make it readable for the end user, then there's no good reason not to do that. In this layer as well, when we've got this, we can add, the la we can add labels on this as well um, in exactly the same way as before. But obviously we're not using pond number, we're using building number instead. And then we'll have the building numbers associated with them as well. Um, so we've got building numbers and pond numbers and then the buildings formatted differently. We could have the ponds differently. Like I said, symbology is all about what works on that particular map to make it clear to whoever's actually looking at it. Um, if it's not clear simplify it make a separate map but if you can make it as a kind of hybrid map with multiple data sets on um, that can be great um, but anyway so that is symbology and labeling um, I'll just say with labeling I think I may have already said this but you have a whole load of different um, options for labels and it's the same with the symbology for well sorry the, the symbology there's a load of different labels that you can play around with to make things look differently um, the best way to learn with them is just to play with them um, I'll probably deal with at some point in the future, I'll probably do sort of like a styling and la labeling masterclass um, specifically focusing on that because it's a big talk pick because there's a lot of different options that you can play around with. And like you say, you've got things like combining um, the same data multiple times with slightly different styling to make certain features stand out. Um, without too much kind of faff in the main attribute table. But anyway, that's enough for now on labeling and symbology. And the next thing we're going to look at is finalizing this into um, something that would be suitable to then include in a report and send to a client.